I'm Becky Durham. I'm the pastor of Peace Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and this is the Sunday Sermon for June 6th. At Peace, we have been gathering for worship on Sunday mornings, both via Zoom online and in person in our sanctuary. And we'd love to have you join us either way if you would like to. You can visit our website, peacepcnc.org, for more information. As we prepare to read and hear from God's word in Mark 3, please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes and unstop our ears and speak to us from your holy word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture is Mark 3, verse 20 through 35. Listen now for the word of God. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to Jesus and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today we jump back into Mark's gospel for a few weeks. We spent the first three or so months of the year with Mark, reading through the first two and a half chapters during Epiphany and Lent. Remember, as Jesus has begun his ministry, he's had three groups of people around him. He's had his disciples, whom he's been calling and equipping for ministry. He's had a crowd growing in number, coming to him for healing and teaching. And then Jesus has had the scribes following him around. These scribes are the religious leaders who are the experts on the law of Moses. They've been following Jesus, not for his teaching or his healing miracles, nor to be equipped for ministry. No, the scribes have followed Jesus so they might catch him doing something that appears to defy the law so that they can build their case against him and have him arrested. And that is who Jesus is speaking to when he talks about the unpardonable sin. Now, this is a little bit messy in the bulletin this morning. I have a point zero in my list of sermon points. But I want to talk about verse 29 before we dive into the rest of the passage. I realize that there is an elephant in the text this morning, and I want to take just a couple of moments to do my best at interpreting that because it's probably pricked your ears and you want to know what Jesus means when he says that there is a sin that can never be forgiven. Verse 22 says that the scribes have come to accuse Jesus of using the power of demons to cast out demons. And so Jesus calls the scribes to him and he tells two parables. We'll get to those in just a moment. And after he tells the parables, he says this, Mark 
328. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For the scribes had said, he has an unclean spirit. So the first thing we need to know is that the sin that Jesus is talking about is not all that mysterious. Jesus is addressing the scribes and their determination to call the work of the Holy Spirit unclean or evil. They are missing the work of God right in their own backyard because they are determined to call it the work of the devil and stop Jesus from doing what he is doing. Never mind that people are being healed. Never mind that people are repenting. Never mind that Jesus has a crowd of people whose lives have been changed. It doesn't fit the agenda that the scribes have, so they are actively working against and slandering the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean that Jesus calls this an eternal sin and says that this person can never be forgiven? Now, I cannot tell you with certainty what Jesus means, but I have read the rest of the Bible and I want you to hear this. In Acts 7, Stephen is speaking. Now, Stephen is a follower of Jesus. He's a deacon in the newly forming church who has been unafraid to witness to what God is doing. He is a threat to the status quo and he's been arrested and sentenced to execution because of his testimony. Stephen will be recognized as the first martyr of the church after this day in scripture. And speaking to his accusers, Stephen says this in Acts 7, 51. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. That was the last straw for this accusing crowd. It says they dragged him out of the city and they and to stone him. And on the way, they laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul, who Acts 8, 1 says, approved of Stephen's execution. Saul, who was a Pharisee, who most certainly called what the Holy Spirit was doing unclean. Saul, who actively worked to thwart the movement of God. Saul, who stood by and collected coats of people executing followers of Jesus, and Saul, who weeks later would be brought to his knees in repentance on the way to Damascus and then change his name to Paul and become an apostle who planted countless churches, called countless pastors and leaders into service, and wrote about one-third of our New Testament. Paul certainly stood in the same tradition of the scribes and Pharisees who came before him as he actively opposed Jesus's ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit. Yet it would be shocking if we one day learn that the Apostle Paul is eternally damned because of it. We can't know for sure, I realize, but the whole narrative of scripture invites us to think more broadly than our initial assumptions about Jesus's words in Mark 3. Have you or I committed this sin? Well, I do think it is a sin when we oppose the work of the Holy Spirit, and we need to ask God regularly to search our hearts and speak to us about the ways that we do that. I often say that the scribes and the Pharisees are some of the most relatable people in scripture to me. I can become very Pharisaic when my beliefs are challenged or my comfort is threatened. Have you or I committed an unpardonable sin? Probably not. If you're concerned about it, you probably are not committing this sin. And I don't think that the whole council of scripture bears up the idea that anyone is beyond repentance, including scribes and Pharisees, ancient or modern. So I think that there has to be more to it. If you want to talk about that some more or share your own thoughts, I wish you would let me know, comment on this video, give me a call, send me a message. I've got time. But now I'd like to go back to the beginning of the passage. So I invite you to take a deep breath. Here's what I really want us to see today. 
At this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus is gathering his true family and is establishing the family business. We are certainly familiar with the idea of a family business. Part of the foundation of our society is the family trade, right? Before there were trade schools and apprenticeship programs and college and grad school, we had the family trade. Sons would learn to do the work that their fathers did. Daughters would learn to do the work that their mothers did. It was expected that sons would carry on the family business, whatever it was. And in our modern society, we've probably all known people for whom that was also an expectation. And we've probably also all known people who decided to step away from that tradition and leave the family business to pursue their own callings and passions vocationally. And we know that sometimes that's a hard thing to do, to step away and do something different than what is expected of you, and also for parents and families to accept that this is happening. And I think Jesus understands these circumstances well, because that's where we find him in Mark today. The previous verse tells us that Jesus has gone home and verse 20, the crowd came together again, so they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And so the first thing we see in scripture today is this, the sanity of Jesus is at odds with the family tradition. The sanity of Jesus is at odds with the family tradition. It turns out that Jesus has become the black sheep of his family. They don't understand what he's doing out there. Jesus's biological family, his mother Mary and his siblings have come to retrieve him. People are saying he's out of his mind. That's probably a little bit embarrassing. It's also troubling because there could be greater repercussions for his actions and his odd teaching because Jesus's religious family has also come to stop him. Remember that Jesus is Jewish. He's accepted the vocation of rabbi or teacher. The scribes have come from Jerusalem to speak against him again as well. And they have the power to put an end to Jesus's ministry, to have him arrested and tried for blasphemy. And as I've already mentioned, they've been building their case. What has Jesus been doing that seems to be breaking with family tradition? Well, in Mark's gospel so far, Jesus has called a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors to follow him. He appoints 12 of them to be his disciples. He gives them the authority to preach and the power to cast out demons. He's gathered a huge crowd that loves him. The religious leaders now have to tread carefully because they are afraid of the crowd's loyalty to Jesus. He's been touching lepers, not lawful. He's been healing on the Sabbath, not lawful. He's been eating in the homes of known sinners, not lawful. He's claimed to have the authority to forgive sins, blasphemous, they said. Jesus is preaching a kingdom where everything seems to be exactly opposite of how things work in the real world. A kingdom where those who mourn are blessed, where the least are made great, where the little child is a leader, where suffering is the way to exaltation. Is Jesus out of his mind like his biological family is hearing? Is Jesus unfaithful like his religious family accuses? No, he's not. He's in his right mind. He has a faithful mission ahead of him, but his family members and his religious leaders do not understand or they refuse to understand as is the case with the scribes. And so Jesus calls the scribes to him and he speaks in parables, two parables that are not clouded in mystery. They're pretty straightforward so that even their unstopped ears might hear him. And as he shares these parables, he also shares his mission. And what is the mission of Jesus? The mission of Jesus is to restore what is lost or stolen. The mission of Jesus is to restore what is lost or stolen. He's been accused of being Beelzebul, 
literally translated, the scribes are accusing Jesus of being the Lord of the flies or the Lord of the dead, like where flies congregate. Verse 23, and Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. Jesus is using logic here. You would think that scribes would be into that kind of thing. Basically, if I'm aligned with Satan, why am I out here messing up all of his plans? If I myself am aligned with the unclean spirits, why am I out here casting out unclean spirits out of the people that they're possessing? If I'm the Lord of the flies, I'm terrible at my job because I'm out here preaching and restoring life. If Satan's house is divided, Jesus says it's only a matter of time. The house won't be able to stand. And speaking of the house of Satan, did you know, asked Jesus, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. More logic coming from Jesus. How could I be doing all of these things if Satan or the adversary is more powerful than I am, how could I get away with casting out unclean spirits and restoring health and life and forgiving sins right here in Satan's house if I haven't overpowered him first, if I haven't already got him tied up somewhere? Jesus is not of Satan or of his family. He's actively working against him. Jesus is on a mission and here it is. To overpower Satan, tie him up, throw him in the basement, and plunder his house. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, who wrote during the era of World War II, talks about Jesus entering enemy-occupied territory. For what purpose? Well, Jesus is the rightful king, the strongest man, and he has come to reclaim and restore the things, the people who have been lost or stolen and are being held captive in the enemy's house. Guess what? It's not just Jesus's mission. It's the new family business. The full C.S. Lewis quote is this, enemy occupied territory, that's what the world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. Who will join Jesus on this mission? His family, not only members of his biological family or the leaders in his family's religious tradition know Jesus is creating a new family. Skipping down to verse 31, then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And so final truth of this passage, the true family of Jesus is about the mission of Jesus. The true family of Jesus is about the mission of Jesus. There were people who said that Jesus was out of his mind and encouraged his mother and siblings to go get him and hide him away. There were religious leaders who claimed he was possessed by an unclean spirit, but Jesus was neither of those things. Jesus was starting a new family business. God is establishing a new kingdom and this kingdom is very different. Some would say, it's upside down. In this kingdom, indeed, the last shall be first, the least shall be great, suffering yields glory, and the outsiders become insiders, and vice versa. Does Jesus mean that these followers are his family and his biological family has no place with him? 
know, we know from the rest of the scripture that Jesus ultimately does not exclude his biological family. His mother and his brother James are mentioned again, and they are in roles of faithful discipleship in those places in scripture. Rather than excluding, Jesus is expanding his family. He's including all who want to be out of their minds with him, all who want to join him in plundering the house of Satan. My family is whoever does the will of God, Jesus says. Whoever joins the new family business apprenticeship program is included. And so I wonder this morning, are you included in Jesus's family? Have you accepted the call of discipleship? Do you desire to do the will of God and will you commit to doing it? If you haven't, or you're not sure, or you would like to, let's talk about it. Again, call me, send me a message, comment on this video, and we'll talk about it. I would love to have that conversation with you. If you're in Jesus's family, you have a mission. We are plundering the house of the adversary. The power of Christ is greater than the power that once ruled this house. We join Jesus in bringing light into rooms that were once dark. We speak life into places once ruled by death. We bring the hope and the joy of the gospel that is for whoever will receive it. If you're in Jesus's family, by the way, <laughs> People may accuse you of being out of your mind. Flannery O'Connor famously said, the truth shall make you odd. And I think that applies to Jesus's family. The kingdom of God is upside down. If it looks like everything is backwards, then you're probably on the outside looking in. But we are people who have the same mind and mission of Jesus. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for this day and we thank you that you have chosen us as your family, that you have called us together, that you give us mission and purpose. And Lord, we pray that you would make our mind be the same as yours. God, that you would continue to call us to proclaim this kingdom that you have brought our bringing will bring. We give you thanks for the mission to speak life and to call others to follow as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us for the Sunday sermon today. Please receive the benediction. May the steadfast love of God give you hope May the redeeming power of Christ give you courage. May the abiding presence of the Spirit give you strength as you serve the will of God this day and always. Alleluia. Amen.